Hello, my name is Chelsea Fitzgerald. I'm a program manager with James Care for Life. Welcome to our caregiver series, Caregivers in Multiple Roles. Dr. Elizabeth Monks will be presenting today. Liz Monks is relatively new to Ohio and to the Ohio State University. Moved in to Columbus seven months ago to pursue her passion of working with cancer patients, survivors, and families with the James Cancer Center. Liz is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health and a clinical psychologist with the James Psychosocial Oncology Department. She received her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from St. Louis University and completed her internship at the University of Wisconsin. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship in psychooncology at Washington University School of Medicine Siteman Cancer Center in St. Louis in 2014. Liz is currently involved in research, teaching, and supervising a health psychology rotation in oncology here at OSU. In addition to working as a clinician full-time, seeing cancer patients, their families, and caregivers to address emotional and psychological needs as they relate to the stressor of coping and dealing with the cancer diagnosis. Although she is a native Wisconsinite and an avid Badger fan, she is slowly but surely becoming a Buckeye fan and taking solace in the fact that she's not from Michigan. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Chelsea. I am going to be talking tonight about um, caregivers and how to manage multiple roles um, while you know caregiving. We all know that when um, folks are providing care to cancer patients that there are life doesn't stop and there's all kinds of other things that, that are going on as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the research about multiple roles and kind of what caregivers can do to try to manage the stress that comes along with trying to juggle um, additional things in addition to caregiving. So some of the objectives for tonight include just uh, briefly going over the definition of a caregiver, talking a little bit about some background information. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about role strain, which is um, some of the terminology that's used in the literature right now when people are sort of juggling these multiple roles, and cover what the research is saying as of recently, and then talk a little bit about what folks can do to try to manage um, juggling these multiple roles. So the latest uh, numbers from the American Cancer Society um, show that there are 14.5 million cancer survivors right now, and the estimation is that will be 19 million by 2024. So those numbers are pretty stark to me as far as how many people are struggling with cancer, but then that makes me stop and think about how many people are in a caregiving role for those folks that are, that are dealing with cancer. So if you figure, you know, for every cancer patient, probably at least one or two or multiple, multiple caregivers. Um, and so about three out of four families have at least one member who is a cancer survivor. So this is really impacting, um, you know, it seems like these days everybody's family and everyone is touched in some way by cancer. So we know that for as many cancer survivors, um, there's just as many caregivers. So some of the, some of the numbers about um, caregivers, and this is numbers uh, related to caregivers that are not, not nurses, not doctors, but care, informal caregivers. And we know that family members, friends, these other informal caregivers that are not necessarily part of the medical team are providing between 75 and 80 percent of care, which I think is a lot. Um, that number, I think, surprised me a lot. Um, it probably doesn't surprise caregivers or somebody who's in that role. They're probably nodding their heads saying, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, about 8.8 .8 hours of care on average per day. Uh, so it's pretty much like having a full-time job, more than that, because I'm sure that's seven days a week and not five days a week. And then um, the average is about uh, four or more years of caring over the course of the cancer journey. So um, four solid years of feeling like this is the level of care that's being provided, uh, which, is, which is significant. 
So who is a caregiver and what is their role? Um, a caregiver has a very key role in the healthcare team, a very important role. Um, their job is to improve the patient's health and quality of life and provide, you know, kind of step in and do whatever is needed. I feel like caregivers do all kinds of things that uh, we may think of the basics, but there's all kinds of things that caregivers can provide um, the people that they're caring for. As the, as the definition suggests, a complex array of support tasks that kind of cross over physical, psychological, spiritual, and emotional domains. And caregivers can really be, can be anybody, a spouse, a partner, children, relatives, friends, neighbors, um, anybody can really fill in as a, as a caregiver. And the caregiver role we know sort of differs by stage of survivorship. So caregivers have different responsibilities and seem to take on different roles depending on where the patient is in their, in their stage of survivorship. So for example, at diagnosis, there may be more of a focus on helping the patient um, gather information about their disease, um, scheduling appointments, keeping track of things, um, you know, dealing with the initial shock of a diagnosis and how that impacts a family, getting organized, you know, all these things that sort of happen at initial diagnosis. And that role may change as the person um, goes through treatment, through maintenance, through a potential recurrence or progression of disease where maybe there's more emotional support that's needed, not that there's not emotional support that's provided along the way. Um, and then even in survivorship, I mean, after people are, you know, shown to have no evidence of disease or in remission, I think um, the the thought is, great, your, your cancer is gone, you know, you're, you're doing great, you can go right back to life as normal, but that is not the case. Caregivers are still very involved with care even um, after, after remission, and that may be just because um, cancer patients have a lot of lasting effects after treatment, whether that's cognitive changes or continued fatigue or physical limitations in some way, or even just we know that the processing of the cancer experience sometimes doesn't happen until sort of after the fact. Um, so patients will kind of be um, in go mode, in survivor mode, doing whatever their medical teams tell them to, fighting their cancer, and then it's sort of not until after they've gotten the clear that they stop and, and sort of take in everything that's happened. And so caregivers have, have um, some responsibilities and roles there of providing support anywhere along the trajectory end of life in palliative care. Um, so caregivers are really managing, managing a lot um, and different roles at different stages. So there are some ways in which cancer caregiving seems to differ from average, regular caregiving. Um, and that um, one key difference is that being a caregiver for somebody who's who's coping with cancer is not always a desired role. It's not always anticipated either. So if you think about um, caring, being a caregiver for children, for example, usually that's um, something that's desired, not always, but typically we think of providing for kids as being a desired role, um, something that you anticipate. Hopefully you have um, a solid nine months of anticipating that caregiving role coming. Um, and typically, you know, when you're caring for children, for example, that's a role that's chosen, whereas when cancer pops up, it's not anticipated. It's not something that's chosen. Um, there isn't a lot of notice. These things just happen and really shake people's lives to the core. So that can be um, a key difference in the role of a caregiver for somebody with cancer. Um, in uh, a survey of a thousand-ish caregivers, um, and this was a National Cancer Institute survey, 90% um, of caregivers reported not being knowledgeable about caregiving. So they really felt like they didn't even really know where to start. Like this diagnosis was is new um, to the cancer patient and to the family and caregivers, but caregiving is new to a lot of people too as far as what is my role? What do I do? How do I take all of this on? 
So as, as I mentioned, there's a complexity to providing caregiver support uh, to those struggling with cancer. Um, this list is just a, a very basic rundown of some of the things that caregivers do as far as um, you know, working with medications, giving out medications, tracking that, um, symptom management, doing the basic things like cooking and doing keeping track of meals and how nutrition is holding up, supervising and um, making sure people are getting, you know, their people that they're caring for are getting to appointments and taking medications on time, keeping up with the regular flow of life, like running errands or paying bills, providing emotional support, um, communicating with providers, a lot of communication with family members. Um, I think caregivers sort of step in to be kind of the spokesperson in some ways. And so that's just, I mean, I feel like that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, I know caregivers do a whole lot more than that. If you stop and think about what you do as a caregiver, I'm sure you could make a list probably a mile long. Um, but the idea is caregivers are doing a lot. Um, and some of the challenges that we know caregivers are facing um, include, um, like I said, being unprepared for caregiving, um, having to deal with the uncertainty of the outcome. This is another thing that's kind of unique to cancer caregivers is cancer is one of those things where there is just inherently a lot of uncertainty, and so caregivers are dealing with that as well. Um, decreased support compared to the patient. So when the patient is uh, diagnosed with cancer, it seems like there's sort of an army that rallies around them typically to provide support, but we don't get that same rallying necessarily around the caregivers. So sometimes there's a decrease in support. Um, we also know that female uh, caregivers report more distress than male caregivers, and I know that's probably not super surprising, and some of the reasons are I think women um, kind of tend to be just identified in our society as more typically um, caregivers are stepping into the caregiver role. Uh, sometimes it, sound, it seems like women don't necessarily feel like they have a choice in their caregiving and are juggling multiple roles and are less likely to seek outside help. So those are some other reasons why it seems like female caregivers, um, you know, they do report more distress than men. And younger caregivers also report more distress um, and more, depre more depression. And we think that's probably because younger caregivers maybe have more demands. They may be just getting settled in a career and starting families and um, just having, having a lot on their plates. And there's also this developmental aspect where younger caregivers are out of sync with their peers. So it's, you know, if you have a, I can think of a, a patient that I have right now in her um, 20 year old daughter is her primary caregiver and she's trying to go to school and trying to figure out her own life and her trajectory and her peers aren't, you know, aren't, don't have anything like this type of stressor on their plate. So um, developmentally it's kind, of, um, it's kind of strange or maybe a little bit out of order for somebody young to be providing care for, for say a parent or something like that. And of course, when you have younger caregivers, they haven't had a lot of practice in caregiving. So um, this caregiver, um, the 19-year-old, said, you know, she was like, I haven't even figured out how to take care of myself yet, let alone take care of somebody else. So there's also not that life experience there either, which I think can contribute to why younger caregivers are, may struggle more. So just covering some of the, the rates of depression that are seen um, in caregivers and patients, um, the American Psychological Association uh, shows that the general population has about a 12-month prevalence of 7%. So in any given year, about 7% of Americans are struggling with um, significant depression. Um, I think that's interesting just compared to oncology in general and that we, we do see higher numbers in, on, in an oncology population. But I think it's interesting that the rates of depression are even higher for the caregivers. So during oncology treatment, about 13% of patients report depression and 21% of caregivers report depression. Um, and when you look at more advanced cancers, 23% um, of patients are reporting depression 
depression and almost 40% of caregivers are reporting depression. So these numbers are pretty stark um, in, I think, really showing that caregivers are struggling just as much, if not more in some cases, than, than the patients are. Um, and I have this little um, picture here about how are you doing. I feel like a lot of times when you ask caregivers how they're doing, their initial response is just to say fine, as though, you know, it's kind of, I think there's a, a guilt um, caregivers sometimes carry, like they can't be the complainer because they're caring for somebody who has cancer and the person with cancer should be the one complaining. But I did um, have a patient tell me, a caregiver tell me once that she says she's fine and fine stands for frustrated, insecure, nervous, and emotional. And that's what she meant when she said fine. And you could, you know, she had a variation of what uh, fine stood for in her head. But um, I think it's just a reminder sometimes to uh, really one thing that we can do is really ask caregivers how they're doing and give them permission to complain a little bit or, or talk a little bit about their own struggles because I think the tendency is to probably keep that keep that to themselves. So when we talk about caregiver burden, and I'm just gonna like really, really briefly touch on this. Um, caregiver burden is the extent to which caregivers perceive that caregiving has had an adverse or a negative effect on their emotional, social, financial, physical, or spiritual functioning. And this can really look different depending on the person and be very multidimensional. Um, but you know, when you're feeling like really just bogged down and like your caregiving is having a negative effect on every part of your being or a certain part of your, your being, then we have caregiver burden. And usually that's characterized by mood changes, lack of sleep, feeling irritable, feeling resentful. Um, there's a whole host of um, risk factors or things to look for that might suggest that somebody is really um, experiencing caregiver burden. But I think most caregivers would say they just feel completely depleted or completely exhausted when they're, they're feeling caregiver burden. And, you know, having this burden of caregiving can really have an impact on employment. Um, we know that folks who are providing care and trying to work at the same time take more time away from work. Um, 14 to 16% of families with uh, somebody in their family with cancer, 14 to 16% declare bankruptcy, so there's really a lot of financial strain. Um, you know, families are made of real people who have their own struggles and their own issues as well, so adding caregiving to that can really be difficult. Um, and, you know, pe different people roll with things a lot differently. So you may, you may know those people that when they encounter a challenge, they just roll right with it and they seem to kind of let things roll off their backs, but others really get stopped kind of dead in their tracks and don't know how to do, deal with it or deal with the challenges. So it can really be a challenge and, and differ based on people's personalities and kind of their previous experiences and how they tolerate this role of caregiving. So multiple roles is sort of the key of what I wanted to talk about tonight because I think caregivers um, have so many roles that they're juggling, so many hats that they're trying to wear. Um, and I think this is just a short list of some of the roles that a caregiver may also be um, trying to manage, being a parent, being a child, a sibling, a worker, a volunteer, maybe a church member, a neighbor, a friend, whatever your roles are in the community, um, I feel like the roles are, are really endless and that's gonna differentiate or differ based on, based on the person. Um, but really, I think these two pictures sort of demonstrate that there can be a whole lot that um, caregivers are trying to manage in addition to their caregiving role. And so there are a few different theories on social roles and the different social roles that we, that we have and the impact that they can have on an individual's well-being. And there are a couple different theories that I'm gonna talk about specifically tonight. One that sort of emphasizes multiple roles is negative, has a negative impact on well-being, and another theory that talks a little bit about how multiple roles can actually have a positive impact on your well-being. So the first theory is role strain theory. This is a really 
old theory that comes out of social psychology from the 1960s, and it's been researched ever since then and is still found to be, to be true, that individuals are more likely to find difficulties in meeting demands from multiple competing roles. So this idea is the more roles there are, um, the more negative of an impact there's going to be because all of these roles are going to be competing against each other. Um, multiple roles can result in competition for a limited amount of time and psychological or physical resources. So this theory sort of explains all of these roles are almost at war with each other and trying to fight for the person's time and energy, and that increases stress. Um, so one, one study, there are, there are many, but one um, particular study found that stress related to providing care for an ill parent was aggravated by three additional roles, being a mother, being a wife, and being an employee. So all of these roles um, you know, contributed to stress. All of them came together and created a negative impact in addition to providing care for, for an ill parent. So role strain, if you think about strain, um, role strain theory means too many roles puts a strain on the person. So on the, on the opposite is another um, pretty old theory that's been around for, for a while, the role enhancement theory, which is much more of a kind of a positive psychology approach, more of a how does, have multi how does having multiple roles potentially help or have a positive impact. And so this theory um, shows that um, greater number of roles means greater number of opportunities and resources um, to help you build social skills, to help improve your self-esteem. Um, so this idea is like, okay, so I have all these different roles that's gonna help me feel like I'm a competent person, that's gonna build my self-esteem, I'm gonna have um, all these opportunities to interact with people, build my social skills, get support. Having all these roles is great. Um, it can really have a positive effect. And so um, this is seen a lot in women who work, women who work and have kids. Um, they report having better physical and psychological well-being than unemployed women who care for children. And I think there's probably a lot of reasons why that could be true as far as um, going to work, I think, provides a degree of respite and also um, in some ways maybe allows um, a mom to have kind of her own identity or something that contributes to her self-esteem. Um, and I think, you know, women at work, you know, have a good support system. If they, if they have good support, that probably also contributes to um, positive, better overall psychological well-being. So these are two, two of the theories out there on multiple roles, one obviously suggesting it's a good thing, one suggesting it's, it's a bad thing. And of course, we have contradictory evidence in the research. Some of the research says, yes, it's definitely role strain. Too many roles is too much, has a negative effect. Um, one example is employed um, women with younger children reported greater conflict between their roles as an employee and a parent and consequently greater psychological distress compared to employed women with older children. So instead of comparing employed women with kids to non-employed women with kids, they looked at women and the age of their children. And when, they, when employed women had younger children, they really felt like there was a conflict between working and being a mom, and so they felt more stress, and that supports the role strain theory. On the other hand, Employed caregivers reported less caregiving strain, le less caregiving strain, and better emotional adjustment than those who were not employed. And this is looking at um, caregivers for those um, who are caregiving for a, a sick person in their family, somebody who was ill, and that was their only role. So they reported that while they were giving um, support and care to their loved one, working was actually something that helped. Um, and so we have support for the role enhancement theory, that an additional role um, is actually a benefit. So one of the more most recent um, research articles out there right now is this article by Kim from 2006, where she specifically looked at these two theories as it pertains to cancer caregivers. A lot of this research has been done with women, employment, parenting, um, and nobody's really tried to apply this to what happens when people are caring for somebody with cancer. What about multiple roles in that aspect? 
And what um, the researchers ended up finding was, of course, partial support for both theories. Um, so I think they, they got close to 800 um, cancer caregivers to fill out surveys. They, they filled out a whole host of um, stress measures, um, what their different roles were, how they were coping, depression measures. Um, there was a measure of how they were developing like meaning and purpose in their life. And so in the end, they found partial support for the role strain theory. So performing two additional roles, so those who were parents and employed and providing care for somebody in their family with cancer, had a greater aggravating impact on the caregiver's cancer caregiving stress and negative affect. So they, negative affect um, relates to higher anxiety, um, more anger, frustration, some of those more negative emotions that we experience. So um, cancer caregivers who were also working and who were also parents reported more of a negative effect once they started having to care for somebody who had cancer. So there was some support for the role strain theory, but also some support for the role enhancement theory. And that came when cancer caregivers were not parenting, but were only working. So their additional role was just being an employee. They, didn't ha they did not have children to take care of. And so those folks reported um, a beneficial impact of having this other role of being an employee while caring for their um, their loved one with cancer and reported uh, more positive affect and having more meaning in what they were doing and feeling like they had a purpose. So in the end, both of these theories, again, are supported you know, partially. It's not all 100% positive and it's not all 100% negative and it really depends on the circumstances. So what it all means um, is that multiple roles that caregivers are likely to have in their lives are most likely going to compete with one another um, in some way, shape, or form. And there may be some strain when caregiving, some increased negative affect, um, hard time finding meaning, just feeling bogged down by all these things, all these different roles, multiple roles competing with each other. Um, this is the first study to indicate that cancer caregivers may actually benefit from being employed while while caregiving. Um, so we know that those who were working and providing care um, had better adjustment, more meaning. They saw their employment and their work as respite, as a break, um, which I, I could see going to work as being sort of a forced break from caregiving or sort of forces you to figure out um, something else for that person that you're caring for while you're working. Um, although I think a lot of, there was some qualitative data, some written um, remarks from some of these folks that participated in the study, and although the, those who were employed said they felt like work was a good place for support, a good respite, um, a lot of them also reported worrying about the person that they were caring for while they were at work. So the positives seem to outweigh the negatives, but they, there were still negatives inherent about, you know, guilt about being away and how's my loved one and what if something happens. Um, so there's definitely some, some positives and negatives to having these, these multiple roles. Some of the questions I think to consider are like, what's the optimal number of roles? Like what, what really is the best for a caregiver. And I think having some kind of respite or break from caregiving is absolutely necessary, but you could see how somebody who's trying to work like 80 hours a week is probably not gonna find that to be very beneficial. So maybe it's more of a, we should look at how does this work for like part-time workers or people who have a volunteering um, job on the side. Um, how many social roles can a caregiver carry out simultaneously that would predict the best psychological adjustment, I think, is the key. Um, what, what is it? Is it one role? Is it two roles? Is it only employment? Is it only parenting? Is it, um, what, what does that makeup look like? And I'm sure that's going to differ based on the person. One thing that I think was missing um, from this study is they only asked if patients or if caregivers had children under the age of 18. And I think the child's age could be really, really crucial in understanding the burden of the needs because somebody, um, say a mom who's caregiving for her husband with cancer who has 
you know, twin newborns versus, you know, a, a mom caring for her husband with cancer who has, you know, a 17 year old who's getting straight A's and is getting ready to go off to college and is very independent and self sufficient and emotionally doing fine are kind of two different stories. Um, I think job stress in general is very important. Um, you know, job stress can be a huge stressor and role to manage in and of itself, um, as well as role transitions. So one thing that we really tend to look at in our clinical work as like psychologists and therapists are these role transitions. These, see, these are the things that seem to um, kind of trip people up a little bit in life. Um, they tend to create stress, they tend to create um, have an impact on your mood. And some of these role transitions are like a job loss or a divorce or um, an illness or moving or mar get, you know, getting married, all these things where there, there's a pretty big change or transition in your role in life. And so I think it would also be really interesting to look at not necessarily how many roles are caregivers taking on, but do they have any transitions, any things that are happening that might um, shake things up or, or create stress, because I think that could probably have a pretty big impact as well. So some of the other, other findings from this research were that the majority of caregivers reported that they received support for their employers. So 77% felt like they had good support from work um, from their employers, their supervisors, and 85% from coworkers. Um, although, n this is hard for me to believe, but no one reported using childcare services, and very few people expressed that they wanted that. So I'm not sure if that's more of a reflection of maybe how old kids were in the study. Um, like I said, they, they didn't ask for specifics on ages, but no one was reporting that they, they were using childcare services or wanted that. Um, so we know support from the workplace is common, and caregivers really benefit from that. So. I think the take home message there is if you're utilizing your coworkers as a source of support, um, keep doing that because that's a good thing. Um, and caregivers who also care for children may not really consider pursuing any more support even though they may be having additional emotional distress. So, you know, I think for whatever reason, I don't know if that's because caregivers feel like it's my kids, it's my job, I don't really wanna ask for help with that, and so they just aren't seeking support or seeking um, resources for helping out with kids, but we know that parents seem to really, really be struggling, especially when they're trying to manage being a parent and working and caring for somebody with cancer. So how do we address, how can caregivers address um, all the roles that they have to carry out and the stress that comes along with it. Um, a lot of these things, I think, are suggestions that most caregivers already know. They've already heard. They know that they need to take care of themselves and maintain their own health and do these things, but they really are, are very, very critical, and sometimes it just takes a, a healthy reminder to, to do these things. But you know, self-care is important, um, maintaining your health, getting to your own doctor's appointments and making sure that you're staying as healthy as you can. You know, it's, it's hard to carve out time for exercise and it's hard to always eat healthy, but these things are, are important. Um, trying to seek support, whether that's through groups or friends or your church or your neighbors, wherever you get support, utilize that support. Um, I think caregivers really benefit from talking to other caregivers, talking to other people who get it, who can validate their their concerns, validate their frustrations. Um, and you know, I feel like when you put a couple of caregivers together, they all just naturally understand where the other is coming from, and they don't necessarily feel like they need to fix the situation or do anything, but they can just be there, be a support, and validate those concerns. And sometimes that's enough to make people feel a little bit better knowing I'm not alone, there are people who get this, um, I'm, I'm not by myself. Um, taking an active role in your medical team is also really important, trying to absorb education and get information, especially if you're in this, you know, I think I said 90% of people who take on a caregiver role and they feel like they have no idea what they're doing, um, ask for help, ask for information, don't be afraid to, to speak up. 
And also don't be afraid to um, delegate, allow others to help, um, get a break where you can. One of the best things that you can do to help care for somebody else is let them care for you. I think a lot of times people don't really know what to do or how to step in and help a family that's got somebody who's going through cancer. And so that can be kind of a helpless feeling. So when you give them something to do or you ask them to help you, you're actually helping them. So sometimes that that reframe helps as just a reminder that it's okay to ask for help from others and to delegate and try to get a break or some respite where you can. Um, it's also really important to try to prioritize what's most important, um, you know, kind of letting back burner things stay where they are, you know, making a, making a list and sort of prioritizing one through five or one through 10 or whatever that looks like, and remembering that it's okay to say no. Um, you, you don't have to say yes to every request, and I think people will just have to understand that you know it's a stressful situation to be caregiving, and you just can't take on more than you can chew. In fact, if you're caring for somebody with cancer, you probably already have more than you can chew and more on your plate than you can manage, so it's okay to say no. Um, for caregivers with kids, it's gonna be important to find um, you know, whatever, whatever resources in your community for child care services, um, encouraging, we encourage caregivers to ask for help from their families to help out with kids. Um, you know, knowing what some of this research is saying about how much of a burden it can be to be caregiving, working, and caring for kids at the same time, I think we really need to encourage caregivers to get some help around um, their parenting roles as well. Um, so that, that's another important aspect to addressing the multiple role stress. Um, so one of the things that we talk a little bit about um, as far as kind of treating the emotional exhaustion or some of the psychological um, you know, stressors of caregiving is to do what's called a gratitude exercise. And so I'm going to play this video here that sort of explains what this means. I want to talk a little bit today about gratitude. It's one of the most well-researched uh, components in positive psychology. And to um, uh, think about gratitude perhaps like uh, uh, hygiene. You, you brush your teeth every day, you take a shower every day, that kind of thing. And uh, if you can include uh, maybe two minutes of gratitude, uh, the impact will be uh, tremendous. Uh, so I want to share a technique um, that has been very helpful. There's uh, some good research on uh, pieces of this, so I'd like to pass it along. Um, you can do it either at the end of the day or at the beginning. And what you do is you think back over the last 24 hours, and you review your day, and you ask yourself what you have gratitude for. And you think about as many specific things as you possibly can and you'd review that last 24 hours and identify each component that you had gratitude for. If you were waiting for a check and it came, if one of your kids got a good grade in school, anything that would be specific would be good. Then think back over that last 24 hours again and think about anything that you're proud of that you've accomplished or that you've done during that time and identify that. So we have gratitude over the last 24 hours and what you're proud of over the last 24 hours. And then think ahead. What are you looking forward to in the next 24 hours? I know these three things sound incredibly simple, but what we know is that if you do this on a regular basis, it starts to change the frame of your thinking. You start recognizing that good things are happening on a regular basis in your life, that there are things that fill you up that you feel good about, and that there are things you're looking forward to. It has the power to reframe our past, take care of our feelings in the present, and help us to look forward to greater well-being. I hope everybody could, could hear um, that little uh, blurb about how to use gratitude and a couple of exercises that you can do to incorporate gratitude into your daily life and that, you know, this has, shows to have a positive impact on our outlook and our perspective when we take the time to think about 
the things that we're proud of, the things that we're thankful for, and the things that we're looking forward to in the future. And I think these are things that probably get pretty lost when you are stressed as a caregiver. Um, I think even in an average day when you, you ask somebody how their day was, typically it's the like negative things that stick out. So even you could have had 15 good things happen, but that one negative is going to tarnish the day. And so I think the, the gratitude exercise is just something to help um, any of us, caregivers, you know, patients can do this too. Just think about, all right, what what are the blessings in my life? What are the things that I'm really thankful for? Um, what things am I proud of? And what do I have to look forward to? And I think of any of these things, you know, if what, I'm, what am I looking forward to comes up empty, that's a good sign that maybe we need to start building some things in to look forward to some positive experiences so that we have a reason to keep going and keep moving forward. And I think that's a, that's a key piece to doing a, something like a gratitude exercise is it helps remind us of the really important things in life that, that are good and aren't necessarily um, challenging, but are, are things that are, that are blessings. Um, people tend to do this in lots of different ways. Journaling is one way that you can do this exercise that um, if you did it daily or not even daily, once a week would be would be great. Um, sit down and just write out over the last 24 hours, like was it, like um, like the video explained. Um, you could do that through journaling, through writing. You could just um, I've heard patients say that they or caregivers say that they do it as a form of prayer, kind of before they go to bed, thinking about what their blessings are, what they're thankful for, for what they're proud of, what's coming up in the future. Um, and there's also, um, you know, some meditations out there. You could, uh, like, look up online or Google gratitude meditations. There's lots of those out there. Or if you're just taking time to kind of be quiet and, and rest your mind, you might incorporate this into some kind of, like, relaxation or meditation as well. So there's lots of different ways that you could incorporate an exercise like this um, in, your, in your daily life. So some of the common caregiver needs that we, that I hear, that come up a lot um, include wanting more information about legal advice, information about um, drugs and medications, help with addressing end-of-life issues, advice with moving a loved one to, for example, like a hospice facility, um, family help, information about what all the services and resources are that we have available, how to cope, how to manage stress, financial issues, information on you know the cancer itself, um, learning how to be a caregiver, communicating with professionals. I mean, the the common caregiver needs are pretty endless, and so there are a few ways that I think we can try to address some of these things. And I think using your medical team is as a source of support and source of information is always key. Um, remembering that, you know, there are, I'm going to skip ahead really quickly here to this list that, you know, when it comes to your medical team, there are social workers, nutritionists, nurse practitioners, clinical pharmacists, financial counselors. There, if you have a question, there's somebody who can answer it. And if they can't answer it, they can help you find somebody. Um, you know, we also have the Legal Aid Society of Columbus does some pro bono work. I have a lot of patients and caregivers that are like, I need to talk to somebody about legal advice or like making a will and I don't know where to start and I can't afford a lawyer. Um, this is just one uh, resource in the community I know that um, offers some assistance around that. And just some other things, um, the American or the cancer support community has this um, pretty handy um, document that has some tips for caregivers. I'll see if I can pull it up just really quickly here. Um, so if you go to the cancer support community and um, look up like the 10 tips for caregivers, they go through some, some tips, some of which I've covered tonight, but I think are just general good things to keep in mind, like making sure that you get connected and find support, getting information that you need, um, embracing your new normal, and sort of, I guess this is just kind of a recognition that you may not be able to do all the things that you are accustomed to doing before you were a caregiver and trying to prioritize and, and accept, I guess, your new role. 
Um, they also talk a little bit about taking breaks and reminding folks that it's not selfish to take a break, that you actually need to do that. Um, remaining involved with your friends and family and trying not to isolate, it can be pretty easy to kind of withdraw and pull back when feeling stressed. Um, making plans for the future, learning to say yes, which is interesting. I think we talk a lot about making sure you know how to say no, but also saying yes to, to help and to support. Um, there are some other, you know, staying healthy, finding new ways to control stress, and setting limits. So I really, I think in a nutshell, this document sort of, um, I think does a nice job of highlighting just 10 basic things you can do when feeling stressed by multiple roles or feeling like you're getting pretty bogged down. And then there's, of course, the the things that we have going on at the James. James Care for Life has great programming, um, like things like this for caregivers, support groups. Um, a lot of the programming, whether that's getting involved with like, you know, the local um, garden or doing some kind of exercise or cooking class or, um, you know, it really ranges music and art therapy. All these things are open to family members and caregivers too. So, you know, sometimes I think it uh, people see these programs and they think like it's just for the patients, but it's for caregivers too. So I want people to know that there are lots of resources and the James Care for Life um, program can be found online. You can um, call and sign up to get on a mailing list to get that. Anytime you're in the James, they're floating around everywhere. Sometimes I feel like they, they aren't seen unless you're looking for them, but they are, the brochures are there. Um, the James also has an online cancer community called Cancer Connect where it's kind of like cancer Facebook, I guess, in some ways, but caregivers and patients can get on there for support. Um, and then things like Caring Bridge are, you know, I think a good way for um, caregivers to disperse information. So Caring Bridge is kind of like a blog or a place to journal and people can follow your posts. So um, you can update on what's going on with the person you're caring for and have everybody kind of go to one place to get that information instead of feeling like you have to deliver the information to everybody. Um, and then kind of similar to Cancer Connect um, is Immerman Angels, which is a one-on-one -on -one peer support program. So you can sign up. Um, it's a national program, and what they do is they match you um, so if you're a caregiver, they will try to match you with another caregiver of somebody with a similar cancer and similar situation. Or if you're a patient, they do um, similar matching as well. And you can sign up, you know, to be a support. So if you are a caregiver and you feel like you've been doing this a while and you have some expertise to share, you can sign up to be um, a support for somebody else. Or you can also receive support in that way as well. So... Those are just some, some options for trying to address the stress that comes with caregiving and trying to manage all of the roles that you know, life has handed to you as well.